Okay, well, I'm going to go ahead and get started, and i got to, I got to run through 105 slides before 5 o'clock, so it's going to be fast when the happy hour starts. <laughs> One of the things I'm going to go over very quickly is some of the general history surrounding the regulation, re, regulations regarding sheep in Alaska, and it's kind of interesting. This four of the main points is 1902, the Alaska Game Act, was, which was the first time we established seasons for various species in Alaska. And one of those, of course, was sheep, moose, brown bear, most all big game species except for polar bear were included in that. Then in 1925, they established the Alaska Game Commission, which is the forerunner of our Alaska Board of Game and Fish. And then in 1950, we went to a three-quarter curl on a permit hunt for the first time. And it's interesting that the only other record I can find or incident I can find of where curl was used as a Criteria for harvesting sheep was in Wyoming in 1922 through about 27. And then in the, in, the, in the 80s, late 80s, we went to full curl. Interesting enough, in the early 1800s, the Russian American company imposed a tax of $5 sheep per resident, and that was on the Kenai and in the Cook Inlet area. Then in 1848, which is about when some of us were around, I guess, the Russians in, uh, transplanted wild sheep to Kodiak. Now, we don't know whether they were doll sheep or from the peninsula in the Soviet, in Soviet Union. And we don't know whether they turned them loose or they had them in pens because we know that in 1805, they had goats down there. They took about seven or eight goats and had them there for like six or seven years. Then in the late 1890s, because the trophy hunting got started on the Kenai Peninsula and in the Cook Inlet area, there was concern over the harvest of sheep and moose, especially. And then market hunting, which was in re relative to the development on the Kenai and in the interior for gold mining. Here are some examples. This is subsistence hunting up on the Canning River in about 1916 by Leffingwell. It's interesting to notice the number of sheep that are on that sled. And here's a picture from Eagle where they were involved in not necessarily mar in market hunting to a degree. And then in 1939, the Game Act set, set seasons of September 1 to December 15 for doll sheep, an annual limit of four doll sheep, and prohibited the harvest of females and curved the market hunting. This is a picture of the Alaska Game Commission, which was established in 1925. And it's interesting that one of their first acts was to make it mandatory to have a guide for all big game animals in Alaska. But interestingly enough, because polar bears weren't included in 1933, there was a question as to whether or not non-residents had to buy a hunting license for polar bear. So they agreed that that was a good idea. But then when it comes to requiring a guide, which was required for all other species, they said, no, we don't have to have, you don't have to have a guide for polar bear. Those five members, much like the Board of Game today, could establish seasons, bag limits, and methods and means. And then again, as an interesting note, in the late 1930s, the, the University of Alaska became interested in breeding doll sheep, crossing doll sheep with domestic sheep. Here's an example of the protege from that crossing. That program lasted for four or five years, then finally it just went away. And this is when we were talking about some market hunting that was still going on in 1939, although it was outlawed or made illegal earlier in the, earlier in the process, it still continued in, to varying degrees in different parts of, this, of the territory. Then in the early 1940s, there were a series of closures that were territorially wide, and these were in dark part due to the military buildup, bad winters, or, and a perception that there were sheep numbers were very low. About this time, Adolph Murray did some work in, the, in, in Denali, which he constructed the age, he was able to, to put together the age structure of these doll sheep populations, at least in that one area. And then Robert Scott, who was a biologist for the U.S. Fish, Bureau of Biological Services or the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, did a lot of survey work. Then by 1950, we had we went into a period we started three quarter regulation, and part of the reason for doing that was to protect females, to prevent over harvest, and to determine the ability of the general public to to um, the general general ability of the public to comply with that regulation. 
That was in large part based on the survival curve of doll sheep, which for the first two or several years is fairly low survival rate, then their mortality drops off. And then in the last, after about seven or eight years, it, it, there's a pretty steep decline in that the number of animals entering that age class that survive to the next year is considerably less than it was in the, in the previous period of from about two to seven years. When they put in a three quarter curl regulation and that that in that made vulnerable this portion of the population to harvest. There were some that never would be able to be harvested under three quarter curl, but a fair amount of them would. Then in 1950, they implemented a 40 permits for the 40 permits for the Talkeet and Chugag Mountains. It was an experimental hunt, and then that, during that hunt, there were 233 applications, and they harvested 12 sheep harvested. The next year, they increased the number of permits issued to 583 for those two areas, and that was split between them, and 90 sheep were harvested. Then in 1952, the, the permit hunt was, was more or less a registration hunt, and there were 908 with 73 sheep harvested. Based on that, they went to three-quarter curl regulation on a territorial-wide basis. Then in the 1970, early 1970s, the technical management area was established with full curl. And it doesn't look, we, we can't find any indication that age was part of that criteria or broom. Although there's some discussion as to whether or not it was. Maybe Ted can remember. Ted doesn't remember? Then in Kenai, they went to less than half curl or greater than eight than full curl for a while. And in the early 1980s, we went to seven eighths curl and then gradually in the late 80s to early 90s, full curl was implemented on a statewide basis. In addition to that, age and broken horn were added to the definition of legal. And that broken horn has now been changed to where the lamb tip cannot, is missing on both, both horns. When we went to full curl, I mean, when we went to eight, then we then there, all all animals were eligible. All males that reached all segments of the population would at some time be eligible for harvest. As opposed to prior to that, those animals that were that didn't, didn't that weren't full curl that had both lamb tips, even though they might be nine or ten years of age, were still, were not able eligible for harvest. It's interesting because that's a, kind of a double-edged sword. We talk about doing away with the age requirement, but if we did away with that, then we'd have a segment of those animals that, that, that would not ever be eligible for harvest. Now to go quickly through the, this judging and aging, the basic age structure, the basic horn structure is a budding surface as depicted here, or frontal. And then we have the outer or orbital, and then the inner or nuchal. In addition to that, although it's not part of the structure, is a keel which goes along where the outer, sur outer and budding surfaces meet. If we look at the inner horn development, we have the skull plate, which is obviously there from the time they're born, which is covered by a skin. And then from that bony, bony plate, a core develops, and over that core, an actual horn is growing. The areas of growth are at the base of where the base of the where the skin and the horn meet over the covering of the core and on the inner surface of the horn itself so that we end up with a with a structure that looks like a series of ice cream cones that are stacked on each other if we look at the growth periods the lamb is born in may and the first visible horn usually occurs in about mid-July. And we think that that horn grows continuously for that first year. So that by November, we have these lamb tips that are maybe two, two and a half, two and a half to two to three inches long. That horn, we think, continues to grow through the winter, which interesting enough to me, or surprising to me, is the fact that as much as this horn growth occurs in May, 22% roughly occurs by mid-May, which is 
certainly before that we would expect good feed to be available. Then at about one year, there's a, there's a bulge occurs in the horn and we do not fully understand what happens, what causes this, but it's fairly consistent. In fact, it, I have yet to cut a set of horn, horns where we weren't able to see that. Then there's a cessation of growth during the winter and it starts again in late February, early March. And again, interestingly enough, a high, a, a, 25% of that occurs in May for the total year. Then each year that, that growth period becomes shorter and shorter as we, as we see it going down like this. The next thing are the, are the, the structure, the horn, horn structure itself, where we have the lamb tip, the one year bulge, the 18 month ring, and this ring is formed at 18 months and it's only counted as two unless as that sheep dies after May of the next year. And we have the true, true growth grooves or rings and then the false ones, which are the real challenge when you're aging these animals, at least for some of them. And then we have these ridges and wrinkles and they, they become an important component of determining whether something's an actual growth structure or not, depending on, especially when you look at it from the side. So when we look at the, I'm not going to do it again because I got messed up. The lamp tip is can come in various forms. Sometimes it's just a bump. Sometimes there's a slight groove around it, and that that varies. Although it's usually it's fairly easy to distinguish normally, but especially on the inside, it tends to be very concave. The one year bulge. Shows us varying characteristics and sometimes there's a ring around it and sometimes they're not, but the one characteristic that I've never seen is for it to have ridges on the outside of it. It typically is smooth on both sides of that. And again, every once in a while you'll see one that has a strong ring and then they're, they're concave on the inside, but not but not to the same degree as what it is on the lamb tip. The next one is the 18 month ring. And that one's usually fairly identifiable because of its general characteristics, which it tends to be oval in shape. And if you see this section here, you see how rounded this is. That's very typical of that 18 month ring plus these ridges that are on both sides of that groove itself. And that groove tends to be very U-shaped and it's very smooth on the, on the bottom side of that U. Then the 30 month ring, which is another one which has some, has some very distinct characteristics. It tends to be, the budding surface tends to be flat. And that's the first time that we usually see that. There's a bump on the inside, which is very strong usually. And St. Venant's curve is the first time it usually expresses itself, which is this V shape that's on the outer, outer surface of the horn. The general ring characteristics are defined as a groove that encircles the horn. The problem with that is all, all the true growth grooves that I've seen have that, but every once in a while you'll see a false growth groove or ring that it's, it has a groove that has that ring going all the way around the horn as well. The other thing that's a very strong characteristic is that on the upper surface of that growth groove it tends to be very rough and smooth on the bottom and then on a secondary or false growth groove it tends to be smooth on both top and bottom and one of the things that happens is that you'll look at nine or ten nine of these sheep or eight of these sheep and they'll be very easy to judge but then you'll get the tenth one or the ninth one that there's some question and as ted said earlier at least in the fairbanks office our, the policy has been 
that if there's any disagreement as to whether a sheep is seven or eight, it tie goes to the runner. But does that happen every once in a while? It does, but it, and it's the same with degree of curl, although we're working on degree of curl, and I'll get into that a little bit later. The other characteristic is this repeating ridge pattern that we see on when we look at the outer surface. This pattern here is repeat, tends to repeat, it's, you can see it here, here, and here. You can see how close they are, they are, and then here they tend to be more spread out and they're smoother. That's another characteristic that's very, very characteristic of a, of a growth segment. And this, this is another example of how you can see that ridge, ridge pattern repeats itself in, in each segment. The other one that, that when you get towards from the about quarter curl to the base or the angles on the base of the horn, those become very distinct. And these segments tend to decrease towards the base, although about 10% of those that I've measured that has not been the case. This shows those growth segments. When you look at the outside, you can compare it to the inside where it's been cut. This area here corresponds to this growth segment here. This growth segment compares to this growth segment here. But when you look at this growth segment, you can see that on the inside, is, there's not a division there. This is a secondary or false growth groove here as well. Does everybody see that? And we're not certain what forms these, we have some opinions or, or, or some speculation, but we do not fully understand how those growth grooves are formulated. When aging, the first thing we try to do is locate the lamb tip, then locate the one year bulge, and then count either of them as one, but not both as one. You don't go. If you go one for the lamb tip, you, you shouldn't go one for the one year bulge, or you can go one for the one year bulge and skip the lamb tip. Next one is the 18 month groove, which has some fairly unique characteristics, at least compared to the lamb tip and compared to the 30 month ring. Count it as two. And then locate the 30 month one and count it as three. And then each ring after that counts as one. Is there, is there any questions on what I've gone over so far? Because I'm kind of speeding along here because we only got three minutes till happy hour. <laughs> In determining the, the, the curl, there's two different things that we look at. First is from the enforcement standpoint is where we, and we have to determine the exact or approximate the exact degree of curl. So we want to know whether it's 352 or 365. Hunters in the field, that's not what they're doing. Hunters in the field, what they're doing is making determinations of whether the animal is legal or not. And I'll show you the difference here. When we're determined, trying to determine actual degrees of curl, it's important that we be able to fit that horn inside a perfect circle. And it's really amazing to me that the number of sheep that fit into a perfect circle. In fact, I have yet to find one that I've done that did not fit into the circle. That's from, elite, from the standpoint of enforcing the regulation. From the standpoint of the hunter, is it harvestable or not? They don't have to have that perfect a view. When you have a view that's like this, even though you cannot determine how many degrees of curl, you know that this sheep is less than 360 degrees. It has to be. And we know that because and even looking from below, which is sometimes easier, we can tell that this angle here, if protrudes in front of the base, in front of this angle here, and whenever that happens, a sheep cannot be full curl regardless of what the plane is that you're looking at on this angle here. Why is that important? It's important from the standpoint of the, when, if you can make a determination that the animal is not harvestable, then you're not spending your time on it. You're not going up to look at it and you're not spending the half a day looking at it to find out that it's sublegal. It's very easy and very quick to make a determination that this animal does not meet the legal requirement. As opposed to this one, which obviously is but it fits into a full curl. 
And the other thing we'll see in a minute, even if this is tilted down, what happens is that the tip of the base goes into the base of the tip of the horn goes into the base of, at the base and forms an M like this, like McDonald's, so that you can take it home and eat it, as opposed to a V. If it forms a V, then it's sublegal. If it forms an M, then it's legal. And again, you, you don't have to have a perfect side view to make that determination. This is a mechanism that we use. And this, this business of viewing these horns from the side has been around for a long time. The first record I can find of it was Robert Scott. I mean, Robert Taylor used it on his thesis for his horn growth in the early 60s. I think Ted Spraker was involved in some of this using a protractor, as was Wayne Heimer and a number of other individuals. But fortunately, now we have more tools that are available to us. So it's, we, it, it takes us about 15 minutes to get this measurement now, as opposed to having it projected on a wall or something. Now, this particular sheep was 117 degrees greater than 360, which made it 477 degrees. From that, we can we can approximate that two years this sheep was about 106 degrees and was eight and seven eighths inches. At three years, it was 15 inches and 193 degrees. At four years, it was 273 degrees. Five years, it was 430, 341, six. And we can go on around. And from this, we can approximate how many years this animal was eligible for harvest under the 300 under the full curl regulation, which on this one was about, about three years. That became an important question for management from the standpoint that when we were harvesting sheep at eight, the concern was that we were killing all these sheep as soon as they got to be eight years of age, but we back aged them and demonstrated that with age, more than 50% of the harvested animals were eligible for harvest the year before. And it runs about the same for the, for the degree of curl which is good because we're not harvesting, which we don't want to harvest all of them, obviously. This is an argal I just snuck in there. Again, the other, although we don't use it, there are two other ways of determining getting the actual number of degrees of curl. One of them is with a perfect circle like this. And the other one is we're taking the tangent off the base and the tip. These two angles are the same from a geometry standpoint. So that when we take this measurement, and now we're in a, because of the software, we're in a better position to do this. Is, this one is more consistent, though, from the standpoint of before we had the software that we have right now. But regardless of what angle this, regardless of what angle this animal is viewed from, this tip still protrudes in front of that base. As opposed to this one. This one, you can see the arc of the base and the arc of the tip match each other. And usually we put it right under the keel because then it allows you to see the outer horn and, and make a better comparison of the, how the two match. This is the M that I was talking about. This, this tip goes back into the base and forms this M shape here. compared to these two. Does everybody see the difference there? So that when you're looking at this particular animal, although that's not a very good circle, still the angle, that, that tip angle protrudes in front of the base. There's obviously a no-brainer. This is a prime example of an animal that is probably full curl, but it's so close that there's no way that I would ever shoot that animal. The other method that's, that's often used is 
stick method, and usually by doing that, we locate the two orbital or base of the horn and then a, a midway down the back of the horn, which is 180 degrees, and then draw a line straight across. And when you're using this method, it's important that you have an equal distance above and below the center line. And then what, whatever the amount of the tip that tip extends above this line is how legal it is. And with doll sheep, just as with moose, even though they're supposed to be 360 degrees, if one is 362 degrees, there's no way in hell, no way that I would shoot it. It's the same with moose. If the regulation says 50 inches, there's no way that I would shoot one that was 51. Given my skill, there's no way I'd shoot one that was less than 55, depending on what your skill set is. But it's important that on those marginal animals that they be passed up, and that's what we see with sheep. The sublegal ones that we see come into the office is because people are pushing the envelope on it. And although the harvest, the harvest of sublegal animals was up around seven or eight percent, that to me that's not good. But that means that ninety-three percent of the people are getting it right, which still is not a reason to not be concerned about it. That doesn't have to be straight a front on look. You can have a side view or angled view and still and still come up with the same measurements as far as an approximation of whether it's greater than full curl or not. You could actually use your rifle scope for that, couldn't you, Joe? Know? I wouldn't. No. No, I if if you can't if you can't tell through a 25 20 power spotting scope, then it's gonna be difficult to tell through a rifle scope. Here's me. I wish I'd, I, I, I would magnify this, but I'm afraid to because the last time I did, I got in trouble. But anyway, this is one where you can see because of this area. Because of the amount of horn that you can see on the other side, it's, it's obvious that this animal is tilted down and since it's barely full curl, it's full curl here, if it was tilted up, then it would be even has full curl by more. As compared to this one, where you have a very good side view, there's no question that this animal is sublegal in that if it turned, it, there's, there's enough space here that there's no way, possible way that I would harvest that. Plus, if you look at the angle coming off the tip compared to the angle coming off the base, there's no question it's sublegal compared to these three animals here. This one is, this one is obviously sublegal. Maybe seven eighths. This one's a little bit more of a curl, but still not anywhere close to full. And then this one. This is one of those that because of the way this, if you draw a line from here to here, you can see that the, the bottom half of that is not anywhere near equal to the upper half. So that means it would have to be tilted down, which even though it shows full curl there, it would be less because it has to be tilted towards you in order to even up this distance in here. And finally, is this one legal? Obviously not. The tips fail to meet the angle test. If it were legal, it would be C would C and B would be parallel, at least parallel to each other as opposed to what A is. By the full curl method, if you use a stick method on it or draw a line, it's approximately half, but it's still short by an inch or two. Is it A? The best guess is no. This is an animal that's obvious when you, I don't know if you, it's, it's, is it big enough on there to see? 
you can see how that tip curves back, even though it's not a perfect side view, there's no question, but that that tip curves back into the base. This is one of the things we're working on now is a 3D model so that we can better fix the circle so that we can get a very accurate depiction of what the actual number of degrees of curl are. And this one's very close, but probably not. But by fixing a circle on this, we can actually determine the degrees of curl rather than going by 7 8 15 16 if you think about a 15 16 that's 22 and a half degrees less than full curl, which on a 36 inch sheep is the equivalent of about two and a half inches. And the problem is that when we do it that way, when we do it by 15 16 or 7 8 or like that, it's almost like saying small, medium, and large. At least this way, by being able to, to determine the actual degrees, it's like using a tape measure. And we're very consistent within a two or three degrees, plus or minus two or three degrees. So with that, I'm sorry that I had to go so quick, but happy hour awaits. And if there's any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Well, it must have been really efficient if nobody had any questions. Yes, in fact, I've, there's a moratorium on my cutting any more of them, because I cut like 40 some of them. But but in order to get the to get the information to see what was going on, we had to do that. And it was another way to verify the age, or at least what we think is the aging process. Because one of the things that happens when you look at a set of sheep horns. One person says it's seven, another person says it's eight, another one person says it's nine. Well, whoever argues the best wins. It's, it's like with moose. If we, if we never measured these moose, one guy says it's 48, another says it's 52, another says it's 55. Unless we actually measure it, we don't know who was right. And it's hard to, correct, to correct, make corrections in the process that you're using. But when we cut these, we get a much better idea as to whether it's an actual growth groove or not. Well, that's one of the things that's happening now is I think we're in a much better position to identify those secondary or false growth groups. Yes. Hey, hey, Joe, do you have, or does the department have this system <clears throat> set up in each department to measure, get that circle on the horns and measure the number of degrees? As we speak, we're working on it. We have it in Fairbanks. But we, it's going through the process now of getting that established. Because one of the things we can do, you can do it on an iPhone to get the image. <clears throat> like you can do it with your moose antlers too. Let me ask you one more question. There was a time four or five years ago, the idea of using a phenometer, set it on the top and get the zero on it and then trace it around. And I, I put that app on my phone and it didn't, I tried it and it didn't work. But one of the problems that we have is when you form a circle, like we did here, we can take the tangent off the actual tip. If you, if you try to take the tangent off, figure out where to take the tangent, then you miss the first part of that horn. So by using a circle, we can go clear to the tip, regardless of how jagged it is, and it, it, it adds two or three degrees or four degrees to the measurement. But, that's, but I'm amazed at how well they fit that perfect circle. But using this app where we can control the angle, we can fit it to the circle, as opposed to before we were trying to, and we, it worked fairly well, but take a picture of what we thought was a perfect side view. But with this app, with this app we can take, and once we get the image, then we can man maneuver it so that it so that the circle fits it. Hey, one more quick question. With the step method, I've never really liked that one, because it seems like they have to be well over full curl. The problem with the stick method is it does not always correlate with the axis of the of the helix right. of the 
because they grow on a cylindrical helix. And that stickness, you may have one that's, that's three inches short of full curl. I mean, three inches short by the stick test, but, may, but be greater than full curl by two or three inches because of the angle. You, whenever you get that circle, it's not looking straight from the side. It's, those horns are always dip down and usually to the, to the back. So you have to be down and slightly forward to get that perfect circle. Which in the regulation book, it shows a perfect side view. What right? The side view is accurate, but not accurately positioned. Because you're not looking at a right angle to the axis, to the sagittal, sagittal plane of the horn of the animal. It's on an angle and it's down to get that helix. So that, instead of that cylindrical helix being straight onto the side, it sits down and angled to the front usually. But if, it, if we always use the stick test as a secondary, as a backup, if we don't think that, if it doesn't meet the circular, circular test. If it if it passes a stick test, then it's legal. But it's not it may not be three hundred and sixty. It's three hundred and sixty degrees, but not by the circle. Because it can be a circle and be three hundred and sixty degrees and not by the stick test. Joe, is that safe to say that's probably the safest method for new sheep hunters to judge sheep from in the field then beyond, you know, being brewed? Say, say that again, please. Is it, would it safe to say that is probably the safest method for a new sheep hunter to judge a sheep if they can't determine it's full curl or they're having trouble determining full curl? Um, if it's broomed or passing the stick test, they would probably be pretty safe if it, if it's passing the stick. I believe that, you know, the department has put a lot of work into developing educational material the last few years. They have a booklet that can be used in the field and then they have a manual. And I believe that anybody that's going sheep hunting should take those two with them and use them and be, familiarize yourself ahead of time. And the sheep are no different than anything else. If it's 358 degrees, then it's, it shouldn't harvest. If it's, if it's close and there's an issue with any question, then it should not be taken. No different than I think with moose. Whatever, you, and to think that you can judge within two or three degrees, uh, -uh. And the other thing is age. Trying to age these animals in the field is really risky because we have a hard enough time when we have them in hand. Yes. That's what I was going to say. Well, I have I have an opportunity to work with some individuals that are really good at aging sheep. I have a lot of respect for them, and every once in a while we get one in where there's not a consensus on it, and the and the arguments that are made are valid across the board. Because one of the things that happens with these sheep is there's, there's a tremendous amount of variation between the horns. You have one set where they're very clear, another set where they're not, another set where you can't tell on the bottom at the base, another one where you may have trouble differentiating between the 18 month and the 30 month range. And every once in a while you get a lot of growth in that, in that one year bulge. And sometimes they'll show a pretty distinct ring there, but generally they do not. I have yet to see one that showed the ridges on both sides, but still, as Ted said, and I think it's absolutely right, the tie goes to the runner. But we get a fair number of in where four people look at it and they all come up with seven. Those ones that are clear, then there should be some consequence to their action. Well, once again, I've talked longer than I should have, but I really appreciate everybody taking the time to go through it and tolerate the little issues I had with try, trying to use a computer. Joe, thanks a lot for your time. Thanks everybody for participating today, showing up everybody online as well that participated throughout the day. Uh, Joe is our last speaker for the evening. Um, our